all of this figurative speech about the wisdom of the world is foolishness to God and back and forth and back and forth we're corroborating what it means in Romans chapter 1 19 and 20 for since the creation of the world God's invisible qualities his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen being understood from what has been made so that all mankind of all ages are without excuse including those who do not worship God at all my conversation with the atheist you're looking I'm looking at the most complex thing in the universe I'm looking at your body mr. atheist where did you think that came from it's plain to you but you deny it but let me explain it didn't come from something more complex Isaac Newton has something to say about that things are devolving not evolving things are coming simplified and broken down and not more complex you can't get something more complex and I explained to him about being a writer okay just take some ink and paper and a little cardboard throw it on the ground in disarray and say write your book it's not gonna do it it needs a superior wisdom like what is the most complex thing in the universe to start writing books and they'll put everything in order but how did that happen the book didn't write itself I wrote the book but who wrote me see so since the creation of the world God's invisible qualities his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen being understood from what has been made so that men are without excuse so be informative to those who don't know God and to those who think they may or may not know God go back to God's wisdom of words in the Bible be careful to convey what it precisely says in the order that it was written so that you don't start editorializing the particular qualities of God his eternal power and divine nature are stipulated as invisible yet they are declared here as clearly seen since the creation of the world <clears throat> that one can clearly see God's invisible qualities his eternal power and divine nature through an observation of creation implies that creation testifies clearly to a creator with a view to his eternal power and divine nature so something in the qualities of creation sends a clear message to all mankind of all ages including those that do not worship God at all that an eternal power was responsible for its existence and that power has a divine nature God and I say to all look to your own body and find out how miraculous and marvelous that is the reason and purpose that what may be known about God is plain as opposed to hidden to mankind even to those who are godless and wicked and suppress the truth about God even that he exists is that what has been made i.e. all that exists including man himself especially man reflects information about God to the extent that it clearly portrays God's eternal power and divine nature for the purpose to show that all mankind of all ages are without excuse when they suppress the truth of the existence of God and suppress the truth that creation clearly shows his eternal power and divine nature and what may be known about him <clears throat> notice that the wrath of God is revealed to men from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of men of all ages who suppress the truth by their wickedness verse 18 in view of the context of verse 20 which has all mankind of all ages in view the occurrence of past tenses and later verses portrays specific examples of the pattern of God's wrath being revealed for all ages in response to man's godlessness and wickedness so individuals of all ages are in view not just a group from the past as some contend God's eternal power and divine nature and what can be known about him has been made known and can be accurately seen can clearly be seen in creation <clears throat> what can be known about God is stipulated as being in plain view in creation furthermore it is stipulated that God's eternal power <coughs> and divine nature can be clearly clearly be seen in what has been made this implies that the eternal power of God motivated by his divine nature his holiness and his absolute righteousness created all things the power it takes to create and maintain creation in its very nature reflects the eternal power and nature of God who only could have created and maintained such a creation evidently you know God just didn't create everything he said man take over man's gonna sit there and die Evidently, there is a magnificence in creation, a complexity, a divine order and purpose, which could only be from and clearly point to God and who he is. This cannot be denied, and when the truth of it is suppressed, it is evident that those men that do that are godless, wicked, and without excuse. So get your information over to him, and then move on. In any case, we're looking at 9 through 16 commentary. Since only spiritual people are able to receive spiritual truth, it follows that the man without the spirit, an unregenerate person, 
would not and could not receive the message of wisdom regardless of his intellectual abilities and accomplice or accomplishments. In using the generic term man, anthropos, the apostle now shows he is speaking of an unsaved man in general governed as he is only by his soulish human psychikos nature, not accepting the enlightenment and truths from the Spirit of God. Therefore, such a person considers those truths to be foolish. They're just unwilling, even though the evidence is there. Paul makes it even stronger when he says that the man without the Spirit cannot understand because these truths can be discerned and understood only with the guidance of the Spirit. So, sukikosk, the Greek word that begins this verse, basically means that which pertains to the soul or life, a word used in the New Testament and patristic literature to refer to the life of the natural world and so contrasted with the supernatural world and the spirit. So from this comes the translation, man without the spirit. So in 2.15 of Corinthians, 1 Corinthians, but he who is spiritual appraises all things, yet he himself is appraised by no man. Okay, that's puzzling. On the other hand, Paul writes in 2.15, but he who is spiritual appraises in the sense of makes judgments about all things, yet he is himself is appraised by no one in the sense of being judged by no one, aha, except God. You have to use the judge, God, the creator, to judge who you are. Don't look. let man make his appraisal of you. So the believer in Christ, for those moments that he follows the leading of God, the Holy Spirit within himself, which was received at the moment of expressing faith in the gospel, Ephesians 1, 13 to 14, he therefore, thereby, during those moments, is enabled to appraise, to make judgments about all things, which the Spirit addresses within the mind of the believer, which appraisals are always in accordance with the words of God's Word, properly studied and interpreted. You don't have to go too far. Just go to that little table where you have your Bible, or, or desk drawer, or whatever, and read it. Now you're getting the appraisal of you in all things. The words, the wisdom of God. You don't have to make judgments, or even try to recall from your own memory, unless you have a good background of studying God's Word. And Having expounded on it for a while, you begin to expound about the things that you know, and you're speaking wisdom from God, because it's in that Bible that sits on your table. Furthermore, as the Bible follows the leading of the Holy Spirit within him, as the believer, furthermore, as the believer follows the leading of the Holy Spirit within him, he is thus appraised in the sense he of making, making, judgments about all things through the leading of the Holy Spirit and by no one else insofar to the extent that he follows that leading which must inevitably be consistent and within the framework of a pop proper study of God's word in accordance with the normative the rules of language, context, and logic for those moments when the believer chooses to be a diligent student of the word. Remember, you're not a diligent student if you cherry pick all over the place and draw your own conclusions without getting in touch with the context of each verse that you quote. Do it in the order it was written. Go back far enough so that when you read that verse, you get an idea of what the context is. Simple reading that you learn in grammar school. When you don't do that, even though you might be a believer and have the Holy Spirit within you, you're making scrambled eggs out of God's Word. Thereby, moment to moment in this mortal life, the believer may diminish the influence that the world, especially the rulers of this world, has upon him by following the wisdom of God through the leading of the Holy Spirit within him constantly corroborating that with a diligent and corroborative and proper study of the words of God's word, it is so often a logistical matter of where the individual spends his time being influenced by the things of the world. Just simple. How much time do you spend in the word of God? How much time do you say, spend influenced by the things of the world, which over, overlap and erase? So the more time you spend in the word of God, the less time you're going to be influenced by the things of the world toward your detriment. So, it is so often a logistical matter. How much time do you spend of where the individual spends his time being influenced by the things of the world or by the Spirit of God within his spirit and through his study of the words of God's Word? Now, the Holy Spirit is going to give you information, but you don't study the Word of God. He's not going to give you anything if you haven't studied it. It's a cooperative measure. You learn within your own capacity, and it's amazing how the Holy Spirit can enhance your wisdom about the wisdom of God. But if you don't make the effort, spend some time, logistical time, in a particular passage in the Bible, and, and beat it to death, go through it like we're doing here, 
you're going to come away all the better for the rest of eternity. Note that elsewhere in Scripture, Paul teaches Christians to make judgments concerning the spiritual condition and actions of himself as well as other Christians, which task is within the leading of the Holy Spirit. All such judgments must be in accordance with Scripture, properly interpreted in accordance with the normative rules of language, context, and logic. You just check on that, and I've done a dissertation on that. All it is is how to read something properly. For those moments that the believer chooses to be a diligent student of the Word, thus enabling the Holy Spirit to lead the believer in a godly direction as opposed to a worldly, ungodly one, albeit it won't be perfect, for no one but the Lord Jesus Christ in his perfect, sinless humanity can claim to be to have sinless moments in his temporal life, 1 John 1, 8 and 10. If we say we have not sinned, we're liars and make God out to be a liar. If we say we do not sin, again, we make ourselves out to be a liar. Yet the Spirit will credit the believer with eternal reward for the believer's participation. Now that's grace. Now in Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 2.16, this stuff is loaded. The phrases, the mind of the Lord and the mind of Christ, relate to the previous context in the verses leading up to 1 Cor 2.16, and which includes an Old Testament expression he has just quoted from Isaiah 64.4. Isaiah 2.16, For who has known the mind of the Lord, that he will instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. So the context progresses from 1 Corinthians 2.9, but just as it is written, things which I has seen, has not seen. Things which eye has not seen, and ear has not heard, and which have not entered the heart of man, all that God has prepared for those who love him. Paul's reference to scripture here in 1 Corinthians 2.9, evidently from the Septuagint, reaffirms that the wisdom of God is predominantly a mystery to mankind because of man's inherent unwillingness to know God, with the exception of those who love him, evidently through a moment of faith alone and his son alone for their salvation unto eternal life, so long as you continue in the Christian faith and not loving him. There can be times in your Christian life you turn away and don't love God. Not you, you, you shut the door on enlightenment from God's word. For God has prepared his wisdom <clears throat> exclusively for those who love him. Those who haven't trusted in his son are not in view, but that was their choice to believe in God's son or not. It is up to them. So it is implied here that in view of those who have trusted in his son for eternal life and are destined to be transformed into eternal beings who will agape love him forever. So for those moments in this temporal life, when you look to God for direction out of self-sacrificial of your life to, to the Lord to be faithful and be directed by the Holy Spirit within you, you're going to be well enlightened. Enjoy those moments. And Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 2, 11 to 12 as follows. For those, for who among men knows the thoughts of a man except the spirit of the man, his human spirit, which is in him? Even so, the thoughts of God no one knows except the spirit of God. Now we believers have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, so that we may know the things freely given to us by God. It's mechanical, yet the Holy Spirit is right there for you. So it's your cooperation, your effort to make it faithful. It's not going to be perfect, but God in his grace will enable you to move forward toward your eternal destiny and be all the more blameless by his grace in this life and you'll be living an existence of blamelessness and perfection in eternity. In these two days, two verses quoted above, Paul presented a point of logic toward a conclusion on the matter of God's wisdom and man's wisdom. With the question he posed in 1 Corinthians 2, 11 to 12, For who among men knows the thoughts of a man except the spirit of the man which is in him? Even so, the thoughts of God no one knows except the spirit of God. Yet they will connect within you by the grace of God within you. Make the effort, the mechanical effort, to study to show yourself approved. Then, so the context is developed that no one knows the thoughts of a man better than the spirit of the man himself who has those thoughts, the one who entertains those thoughts within himself. So much the more, no one knows the thoughts of God except the spirit of God in him, himself. <clears throat> then Paul moves this thought to the believer in Jesus Christ <clears throat> who has the spirit of God within him to convey to him the thoughts of God. Now we believers have received not the spirit of the world, which is foolishness, and not wisdom at all, but the Spirit who is from God, so that we may know the things freely given to us by God. God is out there <clears throat> in you. Just open up that book and start acknowledging, making a diligent effort to study. 